This is the day of Pentecost, the celebration within the church community of the giving of the Spirit or the enabling of the Spirit, for the Spirit has been with us even before this day of Pentecost. And so we light this candle, acknowledging the presence and the power and the gifting of God's Spirit. Thanks be to God. come to acknowledge that God's power is given, not grasped, and therefore we are stewards of that power. On this Pentecost Sunday, we come to give thanks to God and to let ourselves be captured by God's Spirit, to inspire us and to lead us. May we worship in the power of God's Holy Spirit, God's holy breath. Amen. May we be called to worship. Today we celebrate the powerful enabling breath of God's Spirit, shattering the shutters of our hearts. On this day, perhaps clad in our pajamas, sitting at home, perhaps with coffee in hand, may we continue to let the spirit of new life breathe upon us. From near empty sanctuaries through video worship, we gather with our sisters and brothers proclaiming that we continue to experience God's Pentecost. On this day, we want God to help us bless all who remain sheltered in place, safe in God's grace. Though no waving of red streamers together in the sanctuary, we will still continue to speak of God's love and the Spirit's peace for all. So that though apart, we know that we are not alone, so that when that day comes, and we know it will, we will find a community eager to welcome each other back. Let us worship God. As we worship, our prayer this Sunday will be offered in movement. Our Movement in Spirit dance group, whose participants include Gloria Anderson, Camille Beaufort, Marilyn Follett, Gloria Godine, Elise Many, Wendy Morell, Jennifer Payne, and Jalen Wong offer now this movement in spirit prayer. The music is The Open Heart, and it is read by Dan Lanou. Let us enter into this movement prayer. Lord, send me the gift of your spirit to fill this place, myself and the world. Touch me with truth that burns like fire. With beauty that moves me like the wind. And set me free, Lord, free to try new ways of living. forgive myself and others. Free to laugh and sing. Free to lay aside my burden of security. join the battle for justice and peace. Free to see and listen and wonder again at the gracious mystery of things and persons. Free to be, to give, to receive, to rejoice as a child of your spirit.
and Lord, teach me how to dance, to turn around and come down where I want to be. In the arms and heart of your people and in you. that I may praise and enjoy you forever. We thank the movement in spirit for that wonderful expression of prayer through movement and hands. Let us gather our voices together as we sing together this hymn, Gracious God, We Will Not Gather. It is another offering by Carolyn Gillette, who has uh, crafted this hymn for the Pentecost in this time of pandemic. Let us sing together. call to reconciliation. Whether isolated or shattered or not, we know we're not always on our best behavior. Though we might bristle at this, we know deep down that we do welcome God's Spirit's breathing new life into us. Why? Because at times we lock ourselves behind the door of fear, and we are in need of new hope and rekindled faith. So let us confess and pray together, saying, O blowing Spirit of God, we wish we could say that we always welcome your intrusion in our lives. We wish we could always speak with delight of the ways you, wind of power, disrupt our well-laid plans. The truth is, we can seem to help ourselves. Instead, drawing on your strength and leading, too many of us try to go it on our own strength with faulty wisdom. We would, 
we get worn out and disillusioned, and we confess our disappointment. In light of plans dashed and events canceled, we confess that this time of COVID-19 has exposed things within us, as well as deep wrongs and fissures in our society. We confess that we have not been as attentive to the suffering of others as we should have been. Forgive us and transform us. Use us by your spirit to pour love, gospel, and justice into our communities and city. Make us channels of your blessing to all those who are lonely and afraid and worried about tomorrow. Be pleased to increase our faith and our obedience. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us take a moment of silence for our personal confession before God. Hear the good news. In Jesus, God stepped into our world. In the spirit, Jesus stepped into our hearts. The promise has been long fulfilled. The Holy Spirit has been sent to us by grace, not for any, anything we can do. The Spirit has, is here to gift us, to encourage us, to inspire us, to push us, to strengthen us and lift us up when we fail. So let us receive that forgiveness, that encouragement, that opportunity that we're gifted already to go on and to continue in the way of Jesus. So with joy in our hearts in this new day, we sing together, Halle, Halle, Halle. Thanks be to God. And the wind of God's Spirit continues to blow. I hope you can notice the little ribbons here that are moving. And that is to remind us indeed that the Spirit is with us always. And on this Sunday in particular, we celebrate that. Let's lift our voices in celebration as we sing this hymn on Pentecost. They gathered our following hymn. <laughs> Christ is I to worship. 
be to God. Let us listen now for our scripture lesson from Acts, the Pentecost lesson, Acts 2 verses 1 to 21. And this is being read by our Ignite uh, uh, group, uh, a group of young adults uh, at our church. And you'll see and experience that reading now. They are Michelle Bailey, Jason Corbin, Joanna Hamley, Graham Kemkis, Allison Spears. first lesson, we hear the story of the Holy Spirit filling the apostles and empowering them to share the message of the gospel with the people of diverse cultures and different languages. From this time forward, the mighty works of God done in and through Jesus will be told to all the peoples of the earth, crossing barriers of language, ethnicity, religion, and culture. Let us listen for what this same spirit might be doing in our midst even today. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Utterly amazed, they asked, are all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of them, of e then each, how each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mes Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cy Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, 
blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and the glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. A responsive reading is from Psalm 104, verses 24 to 34 and 35b. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan that you form to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they're filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever, and may the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let us continue to listen for what God may be saying to us through the scripture now from John's gospel. We're reading John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. John 7, 37 to 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. In this we find the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A privilege to have a recorded anthem from our Dale Song singers entitled The Spirit of the Lord by Graham Kendrick. And we listen and participate in that now. The Spirit of the Lord is on you now, poured out like oil over you. For the Lord has called and anointed you to bring good news to the poor. Oh, 
song we do miss that ministry and look forward to the day when our choirs and our musical groups our children's choir can be back again offering those wonderful praises indeed we give God thanks let us pray dear God you who have granted great power through your spirit to this world and to each of us we pray that somehow that power would find its way in these words that I offer, that they may be the very breath of you speaking through my breath, that they may be captured indeed and be an inspiration to each and every one of us, including me. This Pentecost Sunday, we seek to be in keeping with your Spirit's desire and your Spirit's prompting. So grant our speaking and our listening, for we pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, this has been a very challenging week, hasn't it? It started with breath, God's breath. It all started with breath. Our very creation and our very understanding of ourselves and of our world as we bear testimony in our scriptures starts with God's breath. Breath is at the source of everything. In the very beginning in our opening book in Genesis, it says, when beginning to create the heavens and the earth, we're told that God's breath or God's spirit was hovering over the waters. And we read, the Lord God formed the human one out of the dust from the ground and breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and the human one became a living creature. You see, in both Hebrew and Greek, the word for spirit is breath. In Hebrew, ruach is the spirit, ruach elohim, the spirit of God. In Hebrew, it's pneuma, pneuma tonthiu, the spirit of God. It is breath. They mean breath, both of them. And so it is all about breath. And throughout the First Testament and the New Testament, when we hear of God's spirit, we are to think and experience breath. Breath is the source of life. Breath is the power given to us from God. The Psalms proclaim, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all of their hosts. You remember Job, Job who was berated by his friends. This Job testifies that the breath of the Almighty gives me life. As long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, he acknowledges that his life and his rescue and the meaning and purpose of his life comes from the breath of God. Also in the prophets, we read, it is the Spirit, or read, the breath of God, who reveals how God's messengers are to call the wayward children of Israel back to God. It is all about breath. He writes, here is my servant, 
whom I will uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit, read breath, upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. It is the breath of God that gathers the people. It is the breath of God that bequeaths the justice necessary for every nation to find themselves in the will of God. And you might remember also the famous story from Ezekiel in chapter 37 where the coming together of the bones, the valley of the dry bones. What is it that animates it, them? What is it that brings them together? It is the breath of God. It is the Spirit of God who will cover them with skin and breath will be given to each of them and they are brought back and reconstituted. In the New Testament, we know that very famous uh, uh, text in Luke where Jesus claims as authority from Isaiah what his mission is going to be, how he is going to express the way in which God seeks to redeem this world, to recapture it to the vision that God has for it. And he begins with the Holy Spirit, this breath, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High with, will overshadow you is what is the story and what is the narrative given to Mary. So very, from the very beginning, the breath is involved in bringing not only Jesus to fruition, but also animating his message. He has been authorized in mandate and mission to breathe upon the world, redeem the world. And this includes God's rescue plan for all the world. And Jesus brings that into sharp focus by speaking about the Spirit of the Lord. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Again, read, the breath of God is upon me, for God has anointed me to preach the good news and to send me to the proclaim the release of the captives, the recovery of the blind, and to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the favor of God's to all. Indeed, what we see is that this breath of God, the Spirit of God, is responsible for everything from the beginning to the end. And we see that even in the life of Jesus' own ministry. His missional undertaking, Jesus attracted the ire of the Jewish elite and the Roman hierarchy, and he was deemed a troublemaker. He was a troublemaker because he was speaking prophetically. He was calling forth the well-being of the outcasts and the so-called sinners and the extra, the, those who were, were ex exiled from community and from society. He went, reached out for the poor, reached out for the lame, reached out for the outcast. And it is the breath of God that animated this commitment because he knew what it meant to proclaim release to captives and recovery to those who are set aside. And the instrument, what we recognize is that after both the Jewish elite and the Roman Empire decided that this troublemaker had to be gotten rid of. He had to be gotten rid of. And the way in which they did that to people whom they wanted to make a spectacle of and they wanted to send a message to any who would want to start any insurrection, it was by putting them on a cross or a stake. They put them there. And the mechanism of this, this torture, this capital torture, was specifically to asphyxiate the victim. So in which they were hung up with their hands often either above their heads or out and the diaphragm would be pressing on the lung. And so you would hear the story of Jesus whose feet, after some time, he had spent a long time on the cross, and he was suffering, he was suffocating. That was the purpose of the cross, to asphyxiate, to take breath away. And they broke his legs so that they would speed up this asphyxiation, and eventually he, di he died. And it says, and he breathed his last breath. So this breath that is responsible for creation, for animating the prophets, for le lifting praise in the temple and the Psalms, and, and directing the purpose and the mission of Jesus. This breath has been snuffed out on the cross. The purpose was to bring an end to the insurrection, or so they thought. This past week, I don't have to remind you, it has been all over our news. Breath has been front and center. Or should I say, the lack of breath, the choking out of breath, the taking away of breath, what I would call the horrific modern-day lynching, racist lynching of a black man by police officers, namely Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis. And I don't have to remind you of the pictures and the images that you've seen on your television all week. This has been a traumatic and a tragic reality. But it is one story in many stories. This has a long history in the life not only of the America, but also in our own country and in the world. The creation of the myth of race that has brought great division and great hurt and harm. 
we watched that video over and over again of officer, former officer, Derek Chauvin with his knee on the neck of George Floyd for nine minutes begging for his life. I can't breathe the very breath of God that has been given to him is being snuffed out. And he, even though non-responsive, still continues for another almost two minutes until he is dead. Breath taken away, breath given by God is never to be taken away by human. None of us have the right to take another's breath away because that is God's breath. And we see this and the wider community is troubled by this. The wider community may not understand and fully appreciate how triggering this is for people of African descent, for black people, for myself and for others with whom I have spoken. I have received so many messages of those who are finding themselves in deep pain because of experiences they've had both so-called minor and macro aggressions in their places of work, in society, all over the place, traumatized again by the images that are shown over and over again. And we have seen this not only in the United States, in our own country, where the, the recourse to justice has been problematic. And so when we talk about the breath of God on this Sunday of Pentecost, God breathing life into all creation, into the prophets, into Jesus, into the ministry, and into each and every one of us, none of us have the right to take that breath away. It belongs only to God. And I know that a lot of people find this difficult to wrestle with, but it is part of our story. It is part of what it means to understand what Pentecost is and this story of the giving of the gift to people from a variety of nations. God has something to say about what we are experiencing now. The timeliness of God's good news is always ready to address issues in our society and contemporary life. The living word of God, the very animated breath of God, is timely. Our text today from Acts makes reference to how God challenges the early apostles and the early church to begin expanding their welcome to begin looking beyond the ways in which they have siloed humanity and to say, no, this gospel, this good news, this, this, this resurrection news is meant for everyone, for all the world. He commands them to go out into the world and bear witness to this, not just for themselves or a single person. This particular day of Pentecost was one of the major feasts in the Jewish calendar. And people from all over would come to Jerusalem specifically to celebrate and to make sacrifice at the temple. As they are gathering and coming, something happens in this particular space. We're told that those who had experienced the resurrection of Jesus and were gathered together. And a point that I want to make very strongly is that when we look and we see the composition of that group, we see there's Mary and there are women who are also included in that apostles. When it says, and they were together in one room, it is referring to all of them. We sometimes forget and think that it is only the 12 or now the 11 apostles, but it is also the women who had come, who had followed Jesus, and who have apostolic status also. They come and they make uh, celebration and they make proclamation. This was meant not only for the Jewish people, but also for the Gentiles. We see that in the story that we learn from the list that is given. Here's a very interesting thing about this list. When the, the Spirit comes upon them and they begin to bear witness, they bear witness and they're speaking to what are called God-fearing Jews from all over the known world, the Near East. And look at the list that is named. The list there that goes down our, our countries and ethnicities that some of which do not even exist anymore. And let me explain, because this is not supposed to be a literal uh, way of understanding, but a metaphorical one. And let me explain what I mean by that. So the Parthians, we talk about the Parthians and the Medes and the Elamites. Now, some of those words, um, as you heard being uh, read by our young people, they did a good job because those are not easy words. Phrygia and all those places that they refer to. But in particular, the Parthians, the Medes, and the Elamites. You see, the Elamites were nearly wiped out by the Assyrians in 650 before the Common Era. And so what happened is that they were eventually absorbed into the Parthian Empire. So they ceased to be. And similarly, the Medes, the Medes were taken over by Cyrus II. And the, the empire of Cyrus took the Medes and they, and they were decimated. So by the time of this particular 
uh, reading, this particular mentioning of these nations, the Medes have been extinct for 500 years. So you see that what Luke is doing, what is being spoken of, is a theological statement. It's not a historical one. It's a theological statement that is meant to address what they had been thinking before, that this message, this message from Jesus was only for the Jews. Luke is demonstrating, who is the, the, the writer of the gospel here in Acts, is saying that this message is for everyone. It is for everyone who has ever been and everyone who will come. And this message is meant to be curating a particular understanding of the generosity of God. And this is what happens. So Peter is the one who stands up and he is saying the people are hearing in their own language and experiencing that. And he is proclaiming, Peter is proclaiming that this is the gift of God to all people. That this is a message and he wants people to hear this message. But this is the same Peter who in chapter 10 of Acts is going to go through his own transformation is going to recognize that, that they had been asking, they asked Jesus, is this the time when you're going to establish your kingdom? The disciples and the apostles were beginning to think that this kingdom was only for the Jewish people, but it is not. It was for all. And in chapter 10, Peter, in connection with Cornelius, experiences an opening, a broadening of his perspective, a generosity of his welcome to the Gentiles also. It was meant for the Gentiles. And so this particular impetus tells us that God is at work through the Spirit, bringing breath and renewal into the life of all people. And we see that, the very fact that he quotes from Joel, he quotes from the prophet Joel, that in the latter days, my Spirit will be poured out on everyone, men and women, servants who are men and women, old and young, everyone is going to experience this. So it's not only in terms of the generations, but it is also in terms of all the various peoples. Everyone is entitled to have the breath of animation, the breath of joy, the breath of justice, the breath of hope and purpose that comes from God. This story is about expanding the generosity of God and to see what is meant by the Spirit coming upon them. We recall that Jesus had told them to remain and they would receive the power from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath. And that power was going to incite them to do things that they had not understood before. And they're now living into what that means, that it is not only for the Jewish community, but for the Gentile community as well. And the outpouring of that breath is great for each and every one. Peter's sermon enables us to do that. This breath is for all. And so when we see the images of a man's breath being taken away, it is symptomatic. It is symptomatic of a long history of oppression, a long history of racism, systemic racism, a long history of exclusion. And what we see in, in our text today, what we see also in the way in which the, the early disciples perceive their own mission is that it was constrained to only the Jewish people and, and God has come through the Spirit, the very breath of God, to expand that and to say this is for the world and that is also today. We're told... After the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples. He was overjoyed to see them, and it says, and he breathed on them. This God is a breath-giving God, a breath-giving God not only for human life and ordinary life, but for spiritual life and for communal life and for the life of justice and hope and celebration and inclusion and welcome. This breath is meant to disrupt any attempt to describe people as not able to be part of God's blessing. Tom Long, uh, who is a, a, a scholar and a preacher and a teacher of homiletics, he writes, Strangely enough, the gift of Pentecost is the gift of something to say, a word to speak in the brokenness and tragedy of the world that is unlike any other word. Did you notice what happened to the church when the Spirit was given? It stood up and it spoke and it moved from silence to language. The breath of God, the Spirit of God moves us from silence to language. We have to speak out and speak up. When we see the kind of, of wrong and the kind of, uh, uh, of oppression that is taking place on our screens, we have to speak up and to speak out, not only because it is in the United States, but it is also here in Canada. When people are excluded and racism rears its head, this systemic, uh, endemic way of dis uh, 
this detracting people from that which is their fulsome right is something that we need to speak about. And we have to ask ourselves, well, what does this mean? This was a question posed in the text. What does all this mean? It is not only that people are speaking in different languages. It is not only that people are coming from different parts of the world. What does it mean for us to live in this moment right now by the breath of God, this same breath who is seeking to raise those who are of low degree, this one who is seeking to bring together those peoples who don't usually associate with each other. What does it mean for us to do these things? It means, I believe, that the very breath transforms us, the very breath of God. It calls us to gather around those and particularly both to speak out and to step in for those who cannot breathe. George Floyd was calling for his mother. George Floyd was saying, I cannot breathe. I can't breathe. And his breath was snuffed out. And there are people in our world, in our communities, whose breath is being snuffed out. Perhaps not literally, but because their hope has been dashed. Because of their, their life has been circumscribed. There are people who are hearing what I'm saying now, who know what it means to have their breath almost taken away because they're living with trauma. They're living with past abuse. They're living with psychological and psychiatric problems that are not being treated. They're living in situations of anxiety and pain that no one is paying attention to and their breath is being taken away. We are called by the Spirit of God to step in, speak up, and to take the knee of oppression off those who are losing their breaths. I believe that God has called us to be agents of peace and love and justice. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, we are not to simply bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive the spoke into the wheel itself. In other words, we are to disrupt the very systems and behaviors and actions that cause people to lose their breath, the breath of the fulsomeness of life, the breath of what they're entitled to by God's giving. This text bears witness to the God who is the source of breath poured out on all people, summoning all people to prophesy about the love the grace, the joy, the justice, the saving mercy of God for all people. We are called to prophesy. This is what Peter does. He, he refers to Joel and the, the gift of prophesying, men and women, young and old, prophesying. Each of us prophesies not only with our mouths, but with our lives into the situation that we find ourselves in. One African-American pastor looking at this, this scene of the killing of George Floyd, he writes this. Deaths like George Floyd should affect us all. May we all, as breath-endowed followers of Christ, practice a kind of collective breathing work that builds a world in which everyone can and is allowed to breathe. And may we remember that God's Spirit, God's breath, is already loose in the world and is giving an eternal breath to everyone. Pentecost Sunday, the giving of God's breath from the very beginning of creation, down through the prophets and the Psalms, through the Gospels, even to now, the giving of God's breath is meant to animate, transform, convert, and deploy those who are seeking to be agents of God's grace and love, power, justice, hope, and salvation. And so, I have to ask you, even as I ask myself, what does this all mean to you? Amen. Friends, one of the gifts that come to us through God's breath is the gift of generosity. The generosity that we offer ourselves to others in coming alongside them in encouragement. The generosity in the sharing of our gifts. And generosity also in the sharing of the money that we have for the purpose of continuing the work not only done through this church, caring for people, reaching out, lifting up the gospel, but also those who are blessed by the way in which we support them. 
And so I want to invite you, and there are a variety of ways in which you can continue to support the ministry here through Canada Helps or a check or going on par, but I want to invite you to take some time now to write a check or to make a commitment to continue the ministry that we are privileged to steward here together. I also want to remind you about some of the other um, announcements. Note that there's still opportunity for folks, some people have making use of this, to phone in for confidential counseling. If that is something that you need, certainly happy to do that. Um, Reverend Alcrease has a number of initiatives that are there. Some, the drop-in on Tuesday at 3 o'clock, the Zoom call, there's prayer that can be offered also on Fridays to phone in. All the information is in the bulletin as well. And we also wanted to acknowledge with great thanksgiving the wonderful ministry that's being undertaken for the children and the youth and the young adult by Camille and, and Julie Creasy and also Liz Harrison who is uh, making those wonderful uh, stories for the, the children each week as well. There's a lot that is going on. We're so grateful for all who are making it work. We'll have, be on the lookout also for this weekend starting early next week. The messenger will be out, the June messenger, and there's lots of very special things in there. I'm told there's some funny picture of a certain person that you may want to laugh at, and that's okay. Um, but we know that we have an opportunity to stay together through the news of the family. So take some time now, if you would, uh, to uh, make your donation or to hold up someone in prayer. We'll take some time to reflect. Let us give thanks for the offering. Gracious God, you have held nothing back. You have given of yourself both in creation and in, in Jesus Christ to reach out and to be here for each and every one, to die, to lose breath in order that we might have breath and be saved. We thank you, gracious God, for your generosity and for the uh, inspiring of generosity in ourselves. We ask you to bless these gifts and these intention of gifts that they may indeed become a way of not only uh, continuing the ministry of this congregation, but blessing many who need the breath of life, the breath of hope, the breath of faith, the breath of justice. We pray that our ministry as a church would continue to extend the breath of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to invite Reverend Nemonji to come now to offer pastoral prayer. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. This past week, the U.S. surpassed 100,000 death mark by COVID-19. Today, in the spirit of Pentecost, in unity and solidarity, we accept the invitation of our brothers and sisters from the U.S. to join with other traditions of faith to mourn and lament the loss of these lives, to acknowledge the empty spaces in many families and communities, to not let this loss to be unnoticed. So as a community of faith, part of the body of Christ, we join in this Pentecost day of lament of mo and mourning, united under the indescribable spirit of lamentation and sorrow that has fallen upon our world as we reach 364,459 plus one death. As in Matthew 2.18, we read, a voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So we lament. A voice is heard in the world, weeping in great mourning. The earth is weeping for her 364,459 children dead to COVID-19. The earth weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. 
A voice is heard in the world. Weeping and great mourning, Canada is weeping her 6,979 children, 2,230 in Ontario, 235 in Ottawa. Canada is weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. A voice is heard in the world, weeping and great mourning. Brazil is weeping, her 27,944, and the UK, her 38,161 children. A voice is heard in the south, weeping and great mourning. Peru is weeping, her 4,230. A voice is heard in the east, India is weeping, her 4,880. A voice is heard in the west, Nigeria is weeping, her 261 children. In many households at this time, there is an empty chair, an empty space. A voice is heard in the world, weeping and great mourning. The U.S. is weeping her 100,000 children dead to COVID-19, weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. 100,001. A voice is heard in the African-American community, weeping for her child, George Floyd, a man of peace, another victim of racial killing. Let us pray. God, you are the keeper of the book of life. With our sisters and brothers in the U.S. and the world, we turn to you today to honor not only their 100,000 dead plus one, and pray for their families. We pray for each one of the 364,459 plus one in the world. We are sure you count in heaven as we, in shock and sorrow, count here on earth. We know that, you, that to you their passing is not an empty data point on death statistics because precious is in your sight the death of your people. God of compassion, we have been surprised by all this. We are asked why, and we need to ask, what does it mean? We have no time, no space, no moment, no adequate rituals to mourn anymore. We are heartbroken that in their final days, many had to be apart from those who were dying. But in faith, we claim that no one dies alone, but all under your loving watch. God of consolation, be with those who mourn today. Bring healing to their hearts. We also pray for the plus one, one too many. His death was not by COVID-19. We pray for the family, friends, and community of George Floyd. With our sisters and brothers of the U.S., we join in pain and solidarity. We raise our voices to you in distress and frustration. Spirit of life, may this be the last death of an era of racism. You are the equalizer because it is you, the one who created us in your image, with the same worth and dignity. With sadness and shame this week, we witness how profound the gaps between us are. How deep are the roots of division in our societies and our imaginaries. We pray that the death of George Floyd brings awareness and transformation. May it open the eyes of many to understand systemic racism and shake those who have been standing by the sides until now to take their, their places as allies. God of all times and places, languages and cultures, open our eyes, for we still fail to see the divine spark of your life in those who look, sound, and act in ways that aren't familiar to us, to those who are different from us. Fill us with the spirit of Pentecost so that we may cry out for justice with words that bring hope to those who live in fear because of the color of the skin. Fill us with prophetic words to speak truth to those who abuse power. Fill us with your love 
to reach the hearts and minds of those who still cannot understand what happens in our societies. In your spirit, we pray for victims and oppressors. Only your spirit may bring true repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation, and transformation. Please help us. Give us the gift of weeping, O oh God. It's not only loved ones who many have lost, but jobs, routines, and activities, plans, familiarity with family, graduation, time with friends, play dates, and classes, potlucks, and worship services. May your mourning, our lamenting, remembering, and learning from all these losses not disappear, but through your gentle spirit keep us tender-hearted, and guide us to a better new normal, we pray. Spirit of healing and power, we hold to you all those who are sick with coronavirus, who are COVID positive, and all those who care for them and work intimately for their healing. We pray as well for the families of the frontline workers in the health system and in all other areas. Hold them in your healing light, O oh Lord. We pray today that if any of us is walking through a dark valley, you may point them to the mountain tops of your presence. If any among us is facing difficulty, grant them the strength and guidance they need. If any is facing life transitions, lead them forward with faith and new vision. Spirit of gentleness, be with the physically needed, needy, with all those ill in their body, those waiting or receiving treatment. We pray that this may work and bring forth healing. Comfort the lonely, especially in those moments of intense emptiness when life seems as if it will never have quality again. In times of pandemic, violence, and conflict among nations, Bless our world in so much need of understanding, reconciliation, justice, and peace. Bring consolation to those in despair with no one to help, and bring hope and protection to those in danger. Gentle Spirit, today connected with your church in all places, we celebrate your coming to us, the fulfillment of the promise, so we join our prayers to the millions celebrating the birthday of the church. Send your Holy Spirit yet again to us. Enkindle us and kindle in us your holy fire. Revive us with your and your whole church to live as Christ's body in the world. As a people who pray, worship, learn, break bread, share bread, heal neighbors, bear good news, seek justice, rest, and grow in the spirit. Breathe life into us again. Blow your rushing wind through our congregation once more. Breathe the winds of power through us. Provoke in us visions and the courage to catch your vision for us. Breathe the winds of power and courage to each of us wherever we are at this moment come to us and renew our spirits. Open us to envision a new normal. Open our eyes to a new and holy vision that we may be your people following your steps in the days to come. Dear God, thank you for this day, for being alive today, for living the miracle of life, for the blessings of this day and for the blossoming of gardens in our city, for the little visitors robins and cardinals and cheap monks and squirrels for the growth of planted seeds. Thank you for your spirit who makes us one in Jesus and that allows us to call on you in the intimacy of our hearts, saying together, Our Father, Father who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be done. done on earth as it, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give us give this us day our daily, daily bread, bread, and forgive us, us our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and let, and let us, us not, not fall into, into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And ever. Amen. amen. And amen. Thanks be to God. We do indeed feel the winds of God, not only today, but other days, to support and encourage us. And so our final hymn invites you to sing out loudly with power. I feel the winds of God today. Today, my sail I lift. Thanks be to God for the gift of the Spirit, for the wind that blows through our lives and through this world. May we be responsive to that wind, the wind of God's breath, so that we may be witnesses to the goodness of God, to the ways of God, and witnesses to the life and justice that we are meant to have and the faith that we are meant to kindle, so that this world may be blessed and become that which God dreams it to be. Be blessed. Be empowered. Go in the spirit. Let us go let us, let us go to live like Christ's body in the world. A people who seek justice, who resist evil, who pray and support others to serve one another in the love of God. So let us go in peace. Amen. Amen. We welcome as our choral blessing at this time the peace, my peace offered by Rob Hilkes, Alexandra Stockwell, and Elaine West. Once again, want to thank our production crew, uh, Debbie McGregor on the piano and organ, Danica Rogers, who keeps us on, on point and on film, uh, to Richard Hamley in the booth, and my dear colleague, Reverend Limonji. God bless you, and have a good week.